coming. I uh, appreciate your interest. I, I hope you know uh, what, uh, what this is about. And I'm going to warn you if you don't that this isn't about how to mushroom hunt, this is about why. So uh, knowing that, um, if you get bored, you can always leave. But I've been mushroom hunting for 25 years or so. And after teaching how for a long time, I realized more and more that what's important is why. And um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how I got to this point and a little bit about why I'm focusing more on why. And um, you can ask questions anytime. And uh, I have uh, pictures I could show you, but we don't really need any. Uh, you know, unless you ask about something specific. But, you know, this morning isn't really that specific. You know, when we mushroom hunt, we look, we look in the foreground for the most part for certain things. But today, I, we're going to look sort of in the background. You heard of mycelium, right? The part you can't see. We're going to talk about more of what's really invisible. Mushroom hunting. Um, so uh, that said, you know, I, I want to... For me, an hour is really short, but I, I might I might take just a few minutes to summarize what I want to say, and then we can talk about it. Um, and the main thing I want to say is uh, that I uh, I grew up afraid, and I still am often afraid. And the main thing I get out of mushroom hunting or wild foods in general is to not feel so afraid. And uh, and I'm going to explain how it does that. And this was called how mushroom hunting can save the world. Because to me, the main problem we have is being afraid. So you heard that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Um, that's my understanding. And uh, I feel more blessed every moment just because I pay attention. And I was running figuratively back and forth to get ready for this talk. And did everyone park it over there? Yeah, did yes. you see anything between parking and coming into this classroom? Yeah. Did, yeah. So you couldn't, could hardly miss them, but I did miss them the first time, and I had to go back to my car. They're on that tree right there, and there's about 35 of them, you know, half size. And I don't know that you can see them from here. Mike Hopping's uh, mushroom walk at 11 is going to go by there. Yeah. And yeah. Show you some other ones. Um, so what I found is that the more I pay attention in life, the more life is full of uh, blessings. There's an Aesop fable of two uh, men walking down the street, and one is like dreaming of what, you know, all the rich, rich riches he's going to have. You know, sort of, or, you know, when you imagine things, you look up. Well, the other guy look, is looking straight ahead, and he sees a bag of gold, and he picks it up because he has his eyes open. So that's what I've learned to do, and it's, it's how I got into this. I, I sold mushrooms for restaurants for 15 years, uh, several hundred pounds a year, and uh, to about over 100 restaurants by the time I quit. And uh, I, I taught myself out of the market because I, I brought, brought other, told other people how to do it. I still wish there'd be even more people doing it because we have this local, you know, sustainable economy that's, um, that we're overlooking, just like those, those mushrooms there. Uh, but, you know, I'm not speaking on that in particular. Hopefully that would be a, an outro of, of what I do have to say. And again, if you have, you have questions at any time, um, and you're welcome to come into the circle if you want, then speak up, because, you know, we're all discovering this to you. Uh, so um, I, I grew up in Miami in suburbia and eating at fast food restaurants, you know, and trying to get good grades and get into a good college. So I was sort of, sort of in the rat race from the beginning. And uh, at some point I burnt out and I dropped out and uh, realized I could sell mushrooms after wanting to cut out of the system and, and go back to the land and not be a part of, you know, what I thought was exploiting people in the environment. And um, eventually, you know, got a stable income. And that was a very stressful time for me. 
But, um, and I was learning on my own and from books, which is not the subject of today, but I spent a lot of time telling people, you know, learning how to use a mushroom book is probably, I don't know, it's probably worse than shooting yourself in the foot. I mean, I don't, probably don't have a great reputation among mycologists here, but none of us, I, a few of us probably in this room, need to be using books to be great mushroom hunters. Um, and that's relevant to this talk because, you know, I'm, I, what I'm encouraging is, is a way of being natural. Like nobody 10,000 or 300,000 years ago needed a mushroom book. Uh, and so there was an abundance of knowledge that you could have just learned from the person next to you. Just like there's still an abundance of food. Yeah. Um, does that make sense? I'm covering a lot of ground. This is 25 years of things I've realized um, in less than an hour. So um, the thesis, you know, what I want to present today is that the, the hunter-gatherer, because this is what I'm talking about, you know, mushroom hunting is part of foraging. Foraging is part of hunting and gathering. Hunting and gathering is part of hunter-gatherer culture. And it's in that order that I came to realize that what I'm doing is really radical because the shift I'm talking about into being afraid happens when we start growing food, which happened at the beginning of agriculture, um, civilization with agriculture. And the shift we need to make in order to get out of what we've created is back into how we approach life as hunter-gatherers. So the hunter-gatherer is not afraid of the world, and the civilized person is. So that all the things we worship in the boxes that we have built box us in. And so of course, you know, we're gonna eat outside the box, and hopefully, even now, maybe if you already realize all this, you, know, you think outside the box, and ultimately feel outside of it. So the first half of today is like about like civilization, why this is important. And the second half is about like why it's important to you and the personal way to like embody this. Because I've learned a lot of tools that don't aren't just about foraging. They're more like about therapy. So I've got cards here for my foraging um, tour company. I pass them around in case you don't stay, um, and you know you don't have to take one. And they'll be up here later. Um, and in a minute, I'll pass around these cards of this um, group that is actually having an event this afternoon. And they mostly deal with addiction. So I'm on the nonprofit of that organization called Seek Healing now. And believe it or not, you know, mushroom hunting is relevant to saving the world, which is relevant not just to climate change, but to the addiction problem. Because it's all wrapped up into an addiction of progress. And these are the things I realize, which is why I don't really uh, teach foraging anymore. I write about it, and I'm also starting to write about how it relates to addiction. Uh, and there's an event, an, an, the annual event for Overdose Awareness Day, which is today, is in Carrier Park this afternoon. And it might interest you to go after that. Um, so, everyone follow so far? Good. Um, great. I, put, I turned these lights off, but hopefully, because I don't like glaring fluorescent, but if it's putting you to sleep, we could turn them on. <laughs> um, sound good? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna open the first half with a quote, if, and I have two quotes for the two halves, and they're both by a man who called himself, uh, you seen that letter A-E put together? His real name is Albert Russell, that was his pen name. He wrote a book in 1916. It was called The Candle of Vision. And there's two lines from that book that really stood out for me. And uh, one was, uh, I knew that the golden age was all around me, and it was we who were blind to it, but it had never passed away from the world. What that means in terms of foraging is that we live in the Garden of Eden. And I was, I was maybe 10, 15 years into doing this before I, I saw on some listserv Somebody mentioned that phrase and it clicked for me. Wow, that's what this is. And that's what we're exp I'm experiencing. That's how, you know, how huge what we're doing is. Um, and I'm looking at my notes, but a lot of this I've already covered. But um, 
the, it's interesting, you know, and I'm not preaching a sort of biblical story here. I put up that pic. Well, it was up. This funny picture I found in a kid's book. Um, and I don't know if you got a chance to see it, but uh, it, it says, um, here it comes, I think. Uh, up here it says, God made everything good. And I really like that because it, can you see the little mushrooms here? And um, it includes mushrooms too. And it's nice when mushrooms are like your, you know, your kind of, um, uh, what's the word, symbol? Like I have people who say, oh, when I, whenever I see a mushroom, I think of you. <laughs> kind of nice, but there's like the most feared mushroom in the world. I have lectures for the mushroom club for like two or three hours on that one mushroom. Know, because there's so much folklore around it and uh, fear and around mushrooms in general. So a whole other topic that I've, that I've gotten into is psychedelic mushrooms and a lot of us are starting to hear a lot more about that and you know, that's also wrapped in the, the importance because what you learn from those is the same thing you learn from any mushroom uh, and it's about not being afraid. Not be afraid to ask a question, for example, today. <laughs> so speak up if you, if you do. Um, unfortunately, I'm losing my eyesight because I've been too academic for too long. But, um, yeah, one of, the, um, one of the metaphors for what I, I've come to like to see the world as, as a forager, uh, is a dream. A lot of us have seen The Matrix, right? You literally like wake up, you know, oh, this is fake, or The Truman Show. You know, oh, this is fake. But it's always like, well, some bad guys set it up. Okay, but what if it's like set up, but it wasn't set up by a bad guy? <laughs> like, that's the sense that w one gets as a forger. Because, you know, you turn on the news and we're looking at basically a nightmare, right? Doesn't it seem like every day it gets worse? Doesn't it seem like every day you know who has done like something even worse? And sometimes several times a day. Okay, that's like that's the pattern of a nightmare. It just gets worse until you wake up. There's no coincidence. So what we need to do is to wake up. This is what foraging has done for me. To realize, you know, oh, there's there's food everywhere. Like this isn't a planet to be afraid of. So my mom, about ten years into foraging, no more than that, into me doing this, she said to me. Alan, when you do your scavenging thing in the woods, are there bears and homeless people? <laughs> and homeless she's, bears. Huh? Homeless bears. What? Homeless bears. Homeless bears, yeah. yeah. Right, the bears aren't homeless. But um, what's the word I learned? It, 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 you shouldn't use homeless. It's houseless. Unhoused. Yeah, yeah, unhoused. And um, so when I do tours, you know, he, I like to say, uh, you know, I start out in the, in the meadows and stuff because half, most of the food is out there. And then when we step into the woods, I, I tell people, you know, we're not, we're not in the woods yet. You know the expression, we're not out of the woods yet. Um, so what we're trying to learn is to not feel like we have to get out of the woods, literally. You know, again, like the world and life is not such a dangerous place that we have to escape from, either into this box we're sitting in right now or into space. You know, or into the cell phone or the computer screen. Um, Y'all with me? Is that good? Okay. I asked the you know, OGS, the Organic Grower School um, executive director once, how come nobody is asking me questions? And she said, well, oh, they're so like, they don't want to interrupt you. <laughs> they're so into it. I, said, well, I hope so. Um, and because this is too easy, I thought this would be hard. I've never, I've never spoken on this topic specifically, and I'm testing it on you, so you my, my guinea pig. Um, I do have this written out in an introduction on my website for free to my book, my book, in case you want to share it with someone. Um, but there's four myths of foraging. Like anyone want to guess what the four things my mom is worried about when I go foraging, or your mom? Yes. The experts can't tell mushrooms apart. Number one. And they're killing their families all the time. Too dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and anyone, any other guesses? That's number one.
what do you worry about or what do you imagine you know, your, your family worries about when you tell them you're picking wild mushrooms, trying to live off the land, going foraging in the woods and encouraging everyone else to do the same thing? See, a lot of these things like we don't, you know, we don't think about necessarily, and I did for a while. Uh, but you, know, you get asked the same question enough times, and you realize, oh, this is what's going on in people's heads, and maybe even in mine, and I'm not thinking about it. So foraging is too dangerous, number one. Foraging is too much work. That there's a reason we invented farming. You know, of course it's better. It came second. Uh, number three. If everyone went foraging, we destroyed the, any you nature. That's no trace. Yeah. yeah. Can't all go foraging anymore. There's not enough wood left. Uh, and the last one is, uh, e even if we did, there, there's not enough out there for everyone. We can't go foraging for two reasons. We just we've hurt nature, and we just we can't eat. There isn't even enough food out there for everyone. None of those is true. The last one is only sort of true if you forage in the true sense of the word. Does anyone know what the word foraging means? You're okay. sending resources from an area and then going to another? Seek. Huh, yeah. To seek. Pillage. It's more than that. Yeah, it's to, it's to pillage. So a foray is what a um, you know military group or a, a group of um, robbers, you know, or marauders would do. You know, it's, you would raid a place. So this is our word for it, and this is not the way that hunter gathers <coughs> the environment. So you know, I had a couple in Vermont that would refuse to like teach foraging unless no one would use that word. So I'm not that extreme. You know, I like to use the turn the word around and just to realize, okay, there is enough for everyone if everyone shares, and there isn't enough because we don't share. That's all. That's it. Uh, even 8 billion people. Yeah. Um, so these are the myths we live with because we live in a, not just agriculture, but an agroculture, you know, one of aggression. And in a self-fulfilling prophecy, like as a culture, if we try to grow food, like we will not have enough. You know, famine did not exist before agriculture. You could read Daniel Quinn, like Ishmael, and a lot of series of books by him about this and a lot of other people have written on it too. So you know, in the space of less than an hour, you know, this might or may not be blowing your mind. Um, but there's a lot more going on here than just you know, getting your dinner in, in, in how radical you know, what we're doing is and how necessary it is. Um, I, yes? So was that like, like so there was no famine before Yeah, that's not half the reason, and to have to feed them is the other reason, because because people rely on a system that's yeah. un, that's unreliable. Yeah, and it's and if famine's defined as like widespread, you know, hunger, then, then yeah, you won't be widespread if you're small group. Of course, if you all stay in the same place, it would still be, and so you you know you might be moved where the food is. Yeah. Um, but more importantly, the lack of food is from the lack of the store. I mean, <coughs> about that word store, okay? It comes from the fact that the food was stored, and what was stored was grain. That's why even today we rely on grain as our staple. And, um, <coughs> and we all begin to see the health consequences of that. This is why you want grass-fed foods, why you, you, people want gluten-free foods, why you need low-carb food. You, all those things come from eating the carbs and the grains that are able to be stored. It's not healthy for us, not healthy for the planet, it's just convenient for commerce. So yeah, it's a lot of radical things that, um, you know, I went to see Marion Williamson last night in Greenville, so I'm a little bit, it's probably good, I'm a little bit tired, um, but it was really inspiring. And, um, you, know, you need a radical approach. It's the only practical approach at this point, you know, is to have a radical one. Um, I'm looking at my notes. 
Um, yeah, the alternative that I'm talking about to agriculture is not foraging, per se, it's, it's permaculture. You know, anyone heard of that? All right, so um, that's what I advocate for, which is a cross between growing food and letting it grow itself. You know, really the fundamental question here is like, does, do we have to grow food or does it grow itself? Is that what the Garden of Eden is? The food growing itself, is us not having to work? We live in a world where we don't have to work. Okay, hunter-gatherers don't even have that word. They don't have that concept. The things they do, the gathering. I mean, when we get off of work, we have vacation. A lot of people, you know, you know, will go hunting, you know, or go foraging if you have the free time, or cook. You know, feel that doesn't feel like one. Um, all right, that's it. We're up to we're up to part two. We're doing well, huh? We can all go outside. After. You can't pick those mushrooms, you have to leave them for my food. <laughs> you go wandering. Um, no questions yet? All right. Um, the second quote is um, also from A.E.'s Candle of Vision. He says, I could, not so I could not so desire what was not my own. And what is our own, we can never lose. Yeah. Um, which is again to say, like well, you know, we don't have to be afraid, okay? Um, and so that's important personally. It has been for me, okay? My stomach right now is like half in knots, okay? I have like, and I'm not even afraid right now. I'm just afraid in general. You know, half my teeth have cavities from like grinding, you know. Um, so it's a very personal thing, you know, to me. And if you're, if it's not to you, you're lucky. Uh, but I, um, what I've learned outside of foraging is valuable. There are things, there are therapies called somatic experiencing is one. Somatic means what? The word means body. Okay. So if you want to get into nature, you can start by getting into the nature you're always sitting in, which is your body. It's the natural part of you. Okay? And you, so you can go wandering around in the woods just as you might not know like anything that's growing in here by name. You might be walking around in your body and never really, you remember that movement, Occupy, what's it called, Occupy, whatever? Occupy your body, because that's na you're always in nature. And that's the first step to not being afraid. Um, so um, if, you know, we've all heard you know, that the problem is up here. You know, I'm really into Eckhart Tolle, right? He's really into people spending time in nature. Why so you can get out of your head? It's in our head that all these problems started. It's in our, out, out of our head that the solution is always there. So foraging is often considered kind of what's called forest bathing. It's a term from Japan. It's a direct translation. It's like Shirin Yoku, it means immersing yourself in nature. Next Saturday, right nearby in Shope Creek, I, I don't know if it's free, there's a program for forest bathing, going in the woods and just being fed just by being there, not because you pick something and put it in your mouth. Um, so that I recommend too. And when you go in the woods for that, you're looking versus seeking. Isn't that what you call foraging seeking? <laughs> yeah. Um, can you, you see the difference? Yeah, I tell people don't ever go mushroom hunting. Why are you going to say that? Because no, sometimes you won't find any good mushrooms. Yeah. So it's good to be aware of that. Yeah, I mean, it's not that a pessimist is never disappointed, <laughs> you know. It's that uh, you, you miss the forest for the fungus. Yeah. You don't have to try to find mushrooms, you know, believe me. Um, they'll find you. Uh, so, wow, um, I'm done. <laughs> what did I miss? Is that all so convincing that you don't want to give me a hard time? I should put up my list of questions, my hard time questions that people ask me. And um, so you actually agree with me on everything, or you, or you haven't woken up yet. Here, this is my uh, company t-shirt. You can buy these online. I didn't bring them with me. Um,
So I'll pass it around. It has all 40 common edibles uh, on the back. It was drawn by one of our guides, Becky Byer. It took us a year and a half to create. Let's see if you can spot um, the top 10 <coughs> most common mushrooms are on that shirt. I'm going to pass these around. This is Seek Healing, which is the name of that um, addiction organization that's really about community. It's local, and we're doing the thing this afternoon. And I'm on the board. And um, yeah, if you want to experience human community, um, you can go to that. If you want to experience nature community, you do what I've been talking about. And you can take any of the tours that my company offers for free, OK? You go on there, and it's like $75. That's because we get 90% tourists. But if you email us, we'll give you a code. You don't have to pay. You just pay whatever you want. Okay. Um, and um, what else I want to pass around? I want to give a shout out to my dead former co-teacher. This is Frank Cook. Mark Williams is over there. I guess teaching. He just handed me this today. It was Frank's uh, anniversary of his passing um, last Saturday. Um, and uh, yeah, remember what is what is our own? We can never lose. So, what do we do now? We can. I find. I can find my questions. This this thing listens to me. You can ask me yours. We can go for a walk. That always sounds good. Um, I could talk about mushrooms if you want that. Um, OK, we're getting there. About maybe. I think it's Abraham, as you know, I just saw Lincoln, the Abraham Lincoln movie. And um, there's a point in there where he says, um, you know, I would have written a short speech, but I was lazy. <laughs> So I wrote a long one. It's really hard to sum things up briefly. And um, I feel pretty proud of that right now. Um, so here's a bunch of questions. You, can you see those? You want to ask me any of these? These are the boring ones. I'm going to get to the uh, exciting ones at the bottom in just a second. But can you read those? If you think of it, want to ask any of those, you can. Um, what about Dog Peak? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. There's a guy in California who's trying to promote wild foods in Berkeley. And yeah, he's just, that's like the bane of his existence, that question. I really like someone who said, you know, dog pee washes off, but GMOs don't. <laughs> um, yeah, so worry about what you can't see. And um, I, I honestly don't know the real answer. I don't know what you can, you know, I suppose you can catch something from dog pee. Does anyone know? Um, I mean, you're in sterile. Right? No, it's sterile when it comes out, but not after it's been out. Oh. Yeah. yeah. It seems like if that were an issue, you'd smell it. Uh huh. You know, so I'm like, yeah, don't smell any dog pee. Eat it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's so much more to worry about. Yes. A mushroom growing amongst poison ivy. Uh -huh. Is that ever a concern? Yeah, it happens a lot, actually, especially hen of the woods, which is coming up soon. And, um, I tried, I was amazed at how difficult it was to answer that question. The question was, does cooking destroy arushio, which is the oil mm. that most of us are uh, um, sensitive to? And the answer I finally found was yes, that, uh, yes, that if you cook it, it's OK. The heat breaks it down. Yeah, the heat will break it. The heat of the, you know, I, I don't have the specifics. It'll be in my book. Um, but uh, my, that was my overall impression yeah which was good news yeah any question i have can be really basic because it's pretty probably please um, is there any such thing as an other resource is there any such thing as over harvesting good question yeah uh, um you know i don't have a very popular answer to that because you know i i tend towards no you know, and most of us try to be really ecological. I said, if you want to be ecological, then like look at, you know, look at the car you're driving, look at the food you're yeah. you're buying in the store. You know, foraging. I'll answer your question in a second for real. <laughs> foraging doesn't hurt the woods. What hurts the woods is not foraging. Okay. Um, yeah, the ginseng is is 
practically extinct. You know, like there are plants that are rare and over harvested. Mushrooms grow back. They're like berries. So that, that tree full of oyster mushrooms, the fungus is in there. You can take all the mushrooms off, just like a shiitake log sprouts shiitakes for 10 years and you keep taking them off because they're just the fruit. You get that? Yeah. Not, oh, not true with every mushroom though. Yeah, like that's the right. hemlock ratio, for example, doesn't it grow over multiple years? We, well, you're close. They're, they're, the perennial mushroom would be the artist conch. The hemlock ratio is an annual and you could pick those and the, 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 it, it'll come back. Some mushrooms like the, the Ganoderma aplanatum is, is gonna take maybe 50 years to get this big. Do you take that? I mean, it'll put out another one maybe. And there's a lot of artist conks in the world, but like you have to realize, I mean, a little patch of um, Michella, not Michella, but um, rattlesnake orchid will take 50 years this big. Rattlesnake plantain, most of us call it. Um, uh, a patch this big of, of lichen, which one was rock tripe? That'd probably take 300 years. And you just bang, pull that thing off the rock. Now, the good news is you get there and there's already like 50 of them on the ground that fell off and you can just take those. Um, so, you know, most of us want specific answers like that. But the big picture is what's important, which is like while you're worrying about over harvesting, 99% of the world couldn't give a shit about the, the earth. And you're not gonna accomplish anything by being careful. At this point, like, you better get out there if you wanna make this, if you're rearranging the chairs on the Titanic. So like, we need to like, change as a culture. Or in like, a decade or so, it'll be too late. Yeah. So don't worry about mushroom picking. We're all gonna die very soon. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I think of it as like with the mushrooms, it's comparable to like if there was an apple orchard, if we harvested every apple, we wouldn't be hurting the orchard. And, but ginseng is a good point. Uh, foragers call, when you dig up a plant, we call that a lethal harvest. And so if you're growing it yourself, you know, yeah, you can do that because that's like, you know, you're harvesting a carrot, so that carrot's gone. But, uh, but in the woods, you know, if you're taking up things by the root and you're killing it so it's a lethal harvest, you know, ramps is an example, but uh, one option with ramps is you don't have to, to get the benefit of it, you don't have to like dig up the root, you can just harvest some of the leaves and let the perennial plant continue yeah. to live. So, so it's possible to be doing all the foraging and not ruining everything, and especially with mushrooms, you know, as, uh, as Alan said, that's just the fruit of the mushroom, you're not killing the mushroom. Yeah, um, and again, you know, I, I hate to be such a downer, but like uh, to worry only about your individual impact right now is grossly irresponsible. You know, it is burying your head in the sand to be concerned about ramps, you know, or about polar bears or any specific species. I mean, half the species on Earth have gone extinct, I think, in the last 20 years. Like, this, this house is on fire. Like. You know, we need some major, major change. Um, what's the, Alan, what's the, Alan, Alan. Yeah. Uh, what's the impact of uh, burning? On, on. Like, like, like forest burning? How does that impact mushrooms? Well, I mean, I'm not an ecologist. It certainly brings out morels in, out west, and I have heard it doesn't here. Um, and, you know, but burning is necessary, you know, if you, in a lot of ecologies, depend on fire. So, um, is that the kind of answer you were looking for? Yeah, I was just wondering if it was a positive thing over time or if it was not yeah. Right. yeah, no, it's necessary in a lot of places. I mean, especially like around the Yellowstone, I mean, it was, those terrible fires often are because, I mean, now they could be climate change, but I remember in 85, I was traveling and studied, uh, you know, I learned from a guy that said, you know, we, if you keep it from burning, you're asking for something terrible later on. I mean, it has to burn. Um, yeah, yeah. I just moved to Asheville and learned about this uh, mushroom stuff, and I like to paint. And I wanted to know how can I keep the mushroom as long as I can um, in his health conditions? Should I put it in the fridge? Should I, what do I do with the mushroom? 
¿De dónde eres? ¿Ah? ¿De dónde eres? Yo, I'm from, I'm from Colombia, yeah. original, but I was living in the West Coast for 22 years. My parents are Cuban. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, the question is, how do you preserve mushrooms to, in order to paint them? You mean just for maybe a few days or? A couple of weeks. A couple of weeks. Most mushrooms will keep in the fridge for a couple of weeks. So don't, you know, certainly refrigerate them as soon as you can. Um, some won't, and I don't know anything that you can do, you know, you don't want them too sealed or they rot, and you don't, and if you don't seal them, and if, if they also dry out, it's for, for the purpose of painting, like. Okay. That's right. But and the fridge work. The fridge will, yeah. yeah. But it will dry yeah. it out, especially if, if, they need some humidity too. Yeah. yeah in a paper Thank bag you. or take a photo. Mm -hmm. Vegetable crispy yeah. roar in your okay. Thank you. Yeah. I did a tour once for Penland and they all wanted to draw mushrooms and so they wanted the scientific names because they kind of wanted to know what they're drawing. It was a weird combination. Like they didn't want to just eat and they only wanted to draw them, but they also wanted the scientific names. So two things I just was not an expert on. Yeah. Could you maybe put it in resin or something? Or are you saying that would seal it too much? Yeah, I mean I one time I painted a reishi in, in like polyurethane to sort of keep it, but you know, it wasn't really necessary. And that was yeah. after dehydrating it. You can't resin, a, like a, most mushrooms are soft. And yeah. I don't know, what if you sealed something that was one of these soft, fresh mushrooms, what would happen? I'd be it would still go bad, it okay. would be anaerobic. Okay. So if it's dehydrated, can I just leave it outside? Yes. That's not bad, that's evil. Uh-huh, yeah. I know, <laughs> it sounds awful. Um, That's what we do when, uh, to our dead bodies, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Unless you wear the mushroom death suit, right? Yeah. Um, all right, you see in these, these questions? There's the, uh, the any other inspiring question? What was the best season to forage? Uh -huh. Well, forage is different than mushroom hunt. Mushroom hunt? Well, I'll answer both. Um, mushrooms mainly grow uh, July through September, maybe into October. Um, there's a few in June, a few in April, a few in May. But um, foraging would be the warm months, you know, going from now, late March, all the way into November for plants. And the most plants by variety are in April or now late March. Um, you know, how's that good answer? Good, I can answer practical questions too. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so tell us about teaching kids. Yeah. So they don't freak yeah. out. Yeah, it's funny. Kids are like more, almost more like conservative than adults in some ways. Um, but uh, how do you teach kids so they don't freak? Well, how do you teach kids? Um, well, don't talk too much. <laughs> they don't want to lecture. And you have to, you have to engage them. Like, it has to be like a, some kind of puzzle or challenge, like at least questions, if not some kind of imaginary <laughs> situation. And um, I mean, kids learn like a sponge, you know, like what things are, you know, even if they might not learn your names, they'll recognize it. I had a girl five years old pick a quartenarius out of the book, and you know, there's a a hundred a thousand area and she picked it out yeah and it was bang I mean it's not today to me it's not the hardest one it was Iodes and Iodes is purple there's a lot of purple quartz but it's not the purpleness it's like the brown dots it has in the middle a lot of us don't notice those but they have these sort of like washed out brown dots and that's how we're, how we're what she noticed um, so um Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, it depends on the kids and the age. I mean, I had high schoolers once, like they literally thought like 90% of things out there were deadly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you believe who taught them that? That's insane. It, the, op yeah, the opposite is true. 99% are edible. Is there helicopter parents have to think of that? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know, I don't, wouldn't say it's difficult. You, Brian, do you have any advice on how to teach kids? You have 20 of them. <laughs> they love mushroom hunting. They love finding them. I think it's great. Just, yeah. Their observations of all the finer details. They're great hunters because they're closer to the ground. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, it's literally true. You'll see more things on uh, at, on the profile. Um, but um, yeah, the kids don't need much help. You know the word education. I was thinking of it this morning. You know what it means? Educo. It means I believe it's to draw out. I think like to welcome would be even better. So it's not schooling. It's not you're putting stuff into them. It's just like you're you know, creating a space. School means leisure. I mean, not work <laughs> to uh, to let what's natural come out already. You know, we want to forage. We want to learn. Um, anything else up here? Yeah, you're. Um, I can't remember the word you used for it, but that's about uh, your program for teaching kids or teaching teachers how to teach. Afi Komen yes, project, right. yeah. Yeah. How is that going? It's not. <laughs> I um, you know, so that my goal for a long time, stated goal, was that every child in the U.S. by 2030, you know, the top 10 most common edibles in their area. That's the goal. And this is what I call the Afi Komen project. It's a Jewish word. In Passover, you basically go on a scavenger hunt looking for this hidden piece of matzah. It's like a cracker, but it's like foraging, and um. And so it's written up on the website, but my real hope in starting that was that someone would take over because I'm not one to make that happen. You know, I'm like, I'm a writer and speaker, but like I'm not like a manager, manifester. Um, yeah, and I'm hoping that will spread, you know, and we're doing some teaching of kids here, and it's a, certainly something that can be replicated. I mean, I've written a 150 page guide on how to teach wild foods. And I'm thinking of just posting that, just publishing it. Um, it I wrote it to train my own guides, but um, it would be useful anywhere. Um, yeah. And, and it's not about the specifics. Again, you know, it's not difficult. Um, I don't. I don't think we give kids enough credit to think they're just going to foolishly like put deadly things in their mouths. Yeah. You have a question? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, wondering about that first question, could this survive anywhere? Uh, but I want to connect it to something you said just a minute ago. You said 99% of the things are edible, but uh, most of us don't have that knowledge about all these plants and, and mushrooms. So, so, how would we go about it? Can we trust our senses? Um, like we, our bodies are amazing. We have these senses telling us what's you know, right to eat, not right to eat. Are we also disconnected from that, or can we actually identify edible things by ourselves? Yeah, great question. I um, we 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 can't immediately trust it because we're disconnected for sure. And whether you can in the long run, um, you know, I have a got a woman who's taught for me. Last night I saw her at Marion Williamson. She said, you can close your eyes and put your hands on plants, and you can feel whether they're edible or not from the energy. No. <laughs> right. Frank says no. No. Uh, no. Earthly. Right. So well, I'm not saying to. to yeah, well, I don't, I mean, I don't, I wouldn't encourage that. I wouldn't encourage relying on that, but it'd be interesting to, to, to practice that and see if it, I don't try it, see if it works for you. Um, I had some people, somebody, telling me how their five or six year old daughter and her friend were sick, you know, they were throwing up and they quizzed about what, what have you been doing and it turned out they had been eating the flower petals of daffodils. Mm -hmm. And I heard about this and I'm like, flower petals of daffodils? And I go and I take a bite and it was sweet and delicious. Oh, no kidding. But I had to spit it out because I'm like, oh, I'm not gonna be throwing up like a little girl, you know, I'm not gonna do that. But it's, but you can see how a kid or anybody, you know, Believing, like, oh, our senses will protect us. And daffodil flowers, they are so good, they can't harm me, but they will harm you. It's, it's the connection between poisonousness and flavor is kind of random. You know, I had a friend who poisoned himself and his wife with jack o lanterns that he thought were chanterelles, and they tasted delicious. You know, that's, the, that's why we know these poisonous things are poisonous, because they were tasted good enough somebody ate them. So your senses won't protect you in that sense. And one of my themes is that like your intelligence won't protect you, your diplomas won't protect you. The only thing that will protect you is good judgment skill, which is a learned thing, you know, like how to decide these things. 
so I, I, I would. You, I mean, if you want to trust your senses, I, you know, more power to you. But I'm, I'm going to like, you know, use other techniques, and then enjoy my senses while I'm alive, not throwing up. Did I pass these yet? Yes, sir. Um, you know, it's a, it, it, it's a, of course, maybe I'm playing devil's advocate, and I'm not telling you that. Um, don't do as I say, <laughs> do as I do. Um, but it's an interesting question that I'm going to pose that people sometimes ask, and it's been implicit here, and this may not be a popular answer, but uh, you know, how did we first figure these things out? How did we find out what's edible? You want to answer that? I'm Trial by error. Right. That's like for the example, eating the daffodil leaves and then throwing up, and now they know. So the most scary part is not getting, you know, whether we're sick, because that's that's kind of teaching you too. But uh, actually <coughs> getting poisoned, like how common uh, is it to actually poison yourself, actually die from something, uh, not including, let's say, mushroom. It's definitely danger. We know that some of them, but let's say plant. Yeah. Um. Mushrooms are, according to um, Michael Bew, the National Mycological Association's chair of toxicology, less dangerous than plants. What was your comment, Alan? Did you have a last name? I said that mushrooms, according to our national expert, are less dangerous than plants. How, how so? Thanks. In that, in that the percentage of mushrooms that are poisonous and deadly is far lower than the percentage of plant species. Out of, what, 10,000, 30,000 North American species of mushrooms, the number of deadly ones is less than 10. Uh, depending, maybe more like half a dozen, depending how you count. Uh, there could be more deadly ones that we don't know about. Um, it's not likely, it's not suspected. Poisonous, maybe two, 200, 300 that we know of commonly, that are common. All the rest are probably harmless. And um, to most people, yeah, even the, what we call edible is, is poison, is, it will make some people throw up. And um, so, you know, I'm not telling you to go out and you know, take your chances, but um, the question remains like, you know, we, we, we see through our filters and through our prejudices. And the filter I'm telling you predominantly we have is one of fear. And I asked you, how do we, did we find out what was edible? And 99% of the time, people say trial and error. That is the assumption. Again, that is the same sort of filter that modern humans take that makes us call what, we're, what we all do foraging. But if you ask the people who actually figured this out, ask the people who, who figured out what's edible and what's not, they don't say trial and error. What do you think they say? Okay, that's one. Any other? God stole them. God stole them. Anything else? Research. Yeah, research. Um, well, figure that, you know, I usually lead the question, and I know some of you have heard me do this before, so you're cheating. But, you know, some of, usually the next thing people say is, uh, you watch animals and what they eat. That doesn't work because, no. right, squirrels, turtles can eat dis destroying angels. Um, uh, the other one is like you ask someone who knows you ask your parents but then the question is what How did they figure who did they ask and, they, and so it goes back you know <laughs> and who has the first person to figure it out and if you go or anywhere in the world and you ask indigenous people they don't say trial and error they say the first person and I'm skipping a, a really practical lesson that I I don't think I've said here because I'm not teaching foraging, but the most important thing to know with foraging is that if you're not sure about something, you don't research it. Because if you research it, you're doing, how am I on time? Because I'm getting, what does that say? Nine minutes. This won't be long, but um, you're doing what we're taught to do in school, okay? If you're in school and you're taking a test and you ask the person next to you for the answer, what's that called? Cheating. Yeah. You're supposed to memorize it from learning from books, looking things up. 
Smart people cheat. Okay, that's what that's what that's the way to stay alive. So cheating is asking, asking for help. What they tell you around the world, an indigenous person, if you like ask them, how do you know if that's edible? What do they say? Duh, we asked. The question is, who did they ask? And some of you already answered. First person, like, if you want to know more about me, what do you do? Who knows the most? We stalk you on you know, the internet. Yeah. We ask you. Yeah, we ask the plant. That's a pretty good answer. So they say we ask the plant, or they say God told us, or we ask animal spirit, or we use our intuition. Um, all of those are, the, are very different than what we assume. Oh, somebody tasted it, you know, and they, uh, and they died, and we learned the hard way. That's not what they're telling you. So we live in a very different world than what we think the world is like. And we worship science right now, and science is our downfall, not our savior. Um, so um, this is all to say that the world, to, to bring us back to the beginning, is a much safer place, a much friendlier place, a much easier place to be in than we normally even imagine. And other metaphysical yeah. sources of information. I think you've said yes. before they took drugs. Yeah. Drugs had something to do with it, you've said before. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the glad you brought back, you know, the psychedelics for all of us can help tremendously. Yesterday I accompanied my girlfriend to a ketamine session, and it is saving her life after 35 years of debilitating, disabling depression. The day before, I took psychedelic mushrooms. They saved my life. I highly recommend that in a really safe environment for people. Um, because then you'll start to see reality. We like to call that hallucination, but uh, it, the opposite is true. Um, yeah. So now hopefully I'm ending on a note that might leave you thinking I'm really crazy. <laughs> That's why we came here. Uh -huh. um, but there are people in this room like you can learn from. Are you teaching later? Mm -hmm. Yeah, three o'clock. So yeah, Frank's teaching teaching at three. Um, you all know obviously about the club. I usually pitch the club at the end. Ask. Let's learn from another person. It's free. I mean, we have maybe the clubs cost us a little bit of money, but ideally in a world, um, I don't know about Colombia, but you know you. If you would go to Europe, you go to Asia, like you know, your neighbor down the street is there. They're happy to teach you. No, some of the children can teach you. Yes. Um, so we live in abundant, a world of a food abundance, of knowledge abundance, and um, you know, there's plenty to share. And maybe I'll see you this afternoon at this, uh, at this event if you want. Um, well, they'd have to miss my class. Oh, that's right. So don't. Um, all right, you know how to reach me if you have more questions. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Al.